Thank you all for coming. Um, so as was said, I'm one of the founders of Regenesis, which is a company originating here in Santa Fe, New Mexico, though we walk, work all over the world. And we work with what we call regenerative development and design, right? And we've worked primarily within what's called the development industry to try to shift what people think about what development is, what it means to actually develop land, places, communities. And we focused on that development industry because it's one of the most destructive forces on the planet. But it could be one of the most regenerative forces on the planet. Right? And here's our book. You're supposed to ask, where can I get one of those? Um, so as was said, as Jackie said, about five years ago, we began an educational program. We had people, particularly practitioners around the world, that wanted to learn how to do what we were doing. So we began this series, The Regenerative Practitioner, that's mostly an online course because we had people in Europe and Africa and India and Australia and New Zealand wanting to join. And we've been doing that uh, five, six years now. And we've been moving toward having local cohorts. So instead of having a group of people scattered all around the globe, we've begun to have um, everyone be from New Zealand or from the San Francisco Bay Area or the Austin area or BC so that they could then have a mass of people that they could work with to work on changing how people thought about planning, design, and development within their communities, right? So we're always looking for what is that strategic little thing we can do to change the system. So um, I would have to say that most of our work at Regenesis is based on this quote of Gregory Bateson's, right? And it, it's very interesting, right? Because it makes us have to go, how does nature actually work? How do we actually think? And what would it mean to think like nature works? Right. Right. So our minds are the headwaters of all human action. That's what determines what we see, what we can see, and what we then decide to do, right? So that might be the most effective place to work. So instead of all these physical things we're doing, maybe we could go back to the headwaters and change things at the source so that it has all these huge downstream effects, right? And even if you look at Malcolm's work, you could see he was very clear. The place, thing we need to change is how we see ourselves and our place in the world, right? And that's the most important and effective place to change the manifestations, right? And we're seeing this from the reversals that are happening today. The laws are not enough if we haven't changed people's perspectives, right? They can easily be reversed. Um, the wonderful Danella Meadows, this is from a posthumous book um, called Thinking in Systems. And I love that she flipped this list upside down. And this is the most effective places to work in a system. Numbers is the least effective place. This is where we spend most of our time. How much carbon are we producing? How much energy are we using? How much water are we using? How much this are we using, how, right? And we love it because we can quantify it and we can say how effective we're being, right? You'll notice as you get higher up or lower down or deeper into this list, she's saying that the most effective places to work are changing the mindset or the paradigm that, of the system or even the ability to transcend paradigms, right? So to change the world, change your mind, change the pattern. So this is the mindset of most of the ecological movement that I've grown up with, right? Human beings are bad. We need to be less bad. We need to, and the best thing, and I, the, the reason I put this up is I've had many students, particularly young students, throughout the years saying precisely this. And the last thing I want to inspire in anyone is that they should hate themselves enough to kill themselves, right? It's not helpful, right? And when I think this way, my options are limited. Right? If I start with the premise that human beings are by nature destructive and greedy and all of those things, 
I only have so much room to move. If I step back and I say, human beings are here for a reason and have essential roles to play in living systems. And the problem is that we've forgotten what those essential roles are and how to play them well. And that the living world is dying for us to remember those and how to play them well. Then a whole range of possibilities opens up. So many of you may have seen this before. This is the alphabet arranged in a particular pattern. So when I was first shown this, I couldn't see it. And I tried to do an arithmetic pattern. One, three, two, one, two, right? Doesn't work. And my friend said, well, if you were illiterate, you would see it right away. And I still couldn't see it. Anyone see it? Yeah, yeah please. Straight lines and curved lines. So all the letters on the top are only straight lines and the letters on the bottom have curved lines in them. So everyone see that now? Yeah. How many people couldn't see it? Right? So when I was shown this, I began to go, so what else am I missing? Right? It was such a powerful demonstration to me of things in front of my face that I could not see. Right? And also, I will never forget this. So um, why can't we see it? When we think a thought or do an action, that neural path is myelinated. It's wrapped with a lipid of fat that enables those neural impulses to travel more rapidly. And this is why you could see it in little kids. This is how we learn to speak, how we learn to walk, how we learn to play an instrument, speak a new language, all of those things. So the more we do an action, the more myelinated it is to do that action, think that thought, whatever. When we read, we don't look at the shapes of the letters, right? We're barely looking at the words. If we looked at the shapes of the letters, it would take us forever to get through a page. And I'm certain that some people who are, quote, learning disabled, they're looking at the shapes of the letters, right? So when we look at this, our minds are habituated to see in a particular way. And this is true with everything. So it becomes, Easier and easier to do what we're habituated to and harder and harder to do things we're not habituated to do, right? Which might be true on a social and cultural and, right? All the issues that we're facing have to do with how our nervous system has literally been created by our habits, right? This is why, whether it's a yogic practice or a meditation practice or a martial arts practice or a legal practice or a medical practice or an architecture practice, that is how we develop habits. And if we're conscious of our habits and choose our habits, then we can develop the practices to create the habits that are functional. To think like nature works, right? So how does nature work? Life is by nature creative, right? Or it's creative by nature or however you wanna say it. We can be creative about how we say it, right? Nature doesn't fix anything. We spend all our time thinking about how to fix things because we live in a mechanical physical world described by Newtonian physics, right? So the roof cracks or the um, fuel tank cracks or your oil pan cracks or whatever it is, we're trying to patch cracks. When that little chick runs out of room and food in the shell, she does not send for takeout and add on, right? And when her beautiful, perfect alabaster dome of a shell starts to crack, she doesn't super glue it or duct tape it, <laughs> right? She uses the physical failure of a structure to enable her to break through to a new world. Imagine going from in a shell to in a nest, where her parents feed her until she and her siblings outgrow the nest and their parents' ability to feed them. And then she fledges and she flies off into a wider world. Right? The same is true for every seed. Unless it swells and splits that beautiful seed coat and its insides turn out and it roots into the ground and sends up leaves, it cannot live. Right? The same thing is true for our thinking. When Copernicus showed us that in fact the sun was at the center of our solar system instead of the earth being at the center of the universe, it created cracks in the foundation of feudalism and the Catholic Church that led to the failure of both of those systems, both of those realities, and the growth, the regeneration of the Renaissance, right? So if you think in your own life of those breaks, 
that you thought were catastrophes at the time that destroyed your comfortable world, but they became the openings to the new world that you grew into, that you developed into. Right? So it might be that climate change is the best thing that ever happened to us. It might be the thing that breaks our complacency and gets us to finally learn to think like nature works. All right. So I've built things most of my life. When my little boy, this is actually my daughter, Eva, two days old. But when, she, when he was young, I was holding him in my arms and he was sleeping. And I was thinking, how would I build his beautiful body? And of course, I would put all his bones together with tendons and ligaments and muscles, and I'd run his nervous system, and I'd run his circulatory system, I'd install all of his organs, I'd see them in skin, maybe a little bit of hair, make sure all the joints worked, I'd fill him up with blood, give him some water, give him some food, and start him up, right? Which of course is not how his body was built, right? But that is how we think about designing building and doing whatever it is with that thing, whether it's a museum, an organization, a curriculum, or a car, right? We design it, we make it, and then we make it run. His body was built by carrying out the exact same processes he carries out now, metabolizing food, using oxygen and water, and moving about, right? Just like our bodies were built by carrying out the processes they still carry out. No one dug the river and filled it with water. The river was made by water moving to the sea. The tree was not built and then turned on. As soon as it put up those leaves and started to photosynthesize, it was taking nutrients and water out of the earth and putting them in the sky and breathing oxygen into the sky and taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere to layer upon layer, build that beautiful scaffolding branching structure of the tree, right? So nature is not making things it is using the processes that they're going to carry out to make the structure. So what if getting around built the car? So everything we do is designed, both structures and process. But most processes are habitual. Oh, we're going to build a building. Oh, you call up the architect. The architect does this thing, and then you pour a foundation, right? I'm going to make lasagna, right? I go get, the, right? that most of the processes are preordained, and we can't... <laughs> Let's not go there. Um, we don't bring much creativity to the process because we've decided what the right processes are, right? Structures are built, processes or patterns are grown. The problem is that structures are entropic. They all fall apart, right? The reason we fix our roofs and paint things and put oil in our cars and all the rest is to keep them from breaking down, right? Whereas living systems are negentropic. The salmon take the nutrients from the ocean back to the top of the watershed. The deer and the sheep that graze down in the fat valley go and rest and pee and poop up in the mountains, right? That everything that the trees grow up, the vines grow up, right? We create increasingly complex systems, right? There's a wonderful book called What is Life by Schrodinger, um, where he created this idea of negative entropy and even wrote an equation for it. You might know his cat. He's probably best known for his cat, um, right? So instead of spending all our time patching cracks, if we begin to look at processes and what it would mean to repattern those processes so they had different outcomes, if instead of thinking about how do we make more apples, we think about, oh, what are the patterns that are manifesting in apples? What are the patterns of processes that are manifesting in income inequality? What are the patterns of processes that are manifesting in ecological destruction? So we are so confused about having living systems function, even our prayers are weird. Because if the lion lies down with the lamb, the lamb's gonna overgraze the watershed and it's gonna be flood and drought and we're all gonna starve to death, right? But this whole idea came from feudalism. If you think that the lion is coming around and is a warlord oppressing the lambs, of course you're gonna pray for them to be nice, right? So, um, out of Leopold, 
the father of ecological restoration, tells the story from when he was a young man and a cowboy in southern New Mexico, southern Arizona. He was out riding with his buddy, and they saw this animal swim in a creek. They thought it was a big doe, and it turned out it was a big she-wolf. She got she-wolf. As she got out the other side, she was greeted by her yearling pups, and he said, as hunters, we have been taught fewer predators would mean more game, and no predators would mean a hunter's paradise. So he pulled his rifle from his scabbard, and they shot all the wolves. Right? When he got to the other side, he saw a green fire, green wildfire, in the dying eyes of the wolf that taught him to think like a mountain. And he realized that the mountain lives in mortal terror of its deer herd. And that without the wolves to control their population, the mountain will be eaten up, right? That's why Green Fire Times has the name it has, right? Um, you may have seen this video about the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone, right? So what's not told in that story is because of the lack of predators, all the animals were doing exactly what we would do. They hung out by the water, right? And they ate up all the reeds and all the willows and the cottonwoods and everything. And first thing they did was they hired Dave Rosgren from Southern Colorado to come up and spent tens of thousands of dollars on boulders and bulldozers. Not surprisingly, the first big flood, it all washed out again. So someone realized, oh, we'll reintroduce this missing species. All of a sudden, the predators changed the behavior of the prey. They're all bunched up, the babies are behind them, they go graze over here, drink some water at night, go graze over here. It entirely changed their behavior. You didn't have to put up fences, you didn't have to herd them, the wolves were the herders. And I think this is actually the thing behind if the lamb lies down with the lion. It actually in the Bible is if the wolf lies down with the lion. That the wolf is the good shepherd. The wolf is the one that herds the animals so they graze and pee and poop across the landscape in a healthy way that lets the trees come back to shade the water to lower the temperature, that lets the gravel beds be clear so that the trout have a place to spawn, right? Let's face it, the good shepherd is going to eat the sheep, right? That's why he's herding the sheep in the first place. So nature is neither competitive nor cooperative, right? If the sh wolf cooperates with the elk, we're going to have floods and famine. It's actually them pushing on one another that appreciates each other, that makes them stronger and smarter and faster, that makes the grass better. The wolf doesn't hate the deer and the elk. The wolf loves the deer the way I love brandywine tomatoes, right? And it has made them, through that appreciation, better and stronger and better and stronger, just like human beings appreciating tomatoes has led them to go from this big to this big. Right? It's because everyone has a unique place and purpose. If you look at any living system, every species, every individual is playing unique and important and essential roles. Okay, so let's do a little exercise here. I want you to think of a child that you know, specific child. Could be you if you were a child once. Think about being a less bad parent to that child. You might scream at them less, shame them less, hit them less, right? Nothing about being a more good parent. You might read to them, spend quality time, right? Do all these various things. Now what if you were going to be a developmental parent? What do you have to think of that's different? <clears throat> to think of who they are, specifically. And you have to not just protect them, you have to think about the appropriate challenges so they will develop and grow. So if we're going to do things in places, we might want to figure out who that place is so we could help develop it. So regenerative communities are vital. They have a vitality to them. And this is true for your house plants. This is true for your garden. This is true for a business. It's got to be at least vital. You can go into one restaurant or one coffee shop or one bookstore, and it's super vital. You go to another one, and it's not. It has to be viable within its environment, within its ecosystem, and it has to be capable of evolution. In a world that's constantly changing, if you're not evolving, there's no way you're going to remain viable within your environment. Right? So the key to regenerative anything 
is that ability to develop, to continue to grow, to be creative as life and nature are. So I'm going to give you a brief um, framework here. We live in a world that's increasingly a two-force world, as Gurdjieff would say. There's, the, there's, there's your opinion. No, I'm sorry. There's my opinion and there's evil, right? <laughs> and increasingly, this is the nature of our conversation, right? Um, Gurdjieff said, there's only when there's three forces present is anything new come into existence. Creative, right? So um, you wanted to get here today. You had this activating force. You met all these restraining forces. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, I don't want to get dressed. Oh, I have to drive across town. I have to find park, right? All these various things that I need to do. Um, and usually we compromise in one way or another. But when this reconciling force comes into existence, it's because we're valuing both sides. I'm actually going to skip a couple of slides here. Oh, maybe I'll tell this story. Um, so this little man is Sensei Uishiba, who started Aikido, the way of peace. And this big guy is uh, Terry Dobson, his first American student. And Terry tells the story of he was 22 years old. He'd been studying with Uishiba for three years. It's whatever, six foot something, 250 pounds, wanted to show his stuff. Uishiba kept saying, do not fight. See, tough guy, walk away. So he's going home on the train. This drunk guy covered in vomit gets on the train, shoving pregnant ladies down in the seats. You know, Terry Dobson goes, ah, sensei can't say nothing. Stands up. The guy comes toward him, ah! And they hear this little man say, hey! And they look, this nicely dressed elderly Japanese man, hey, you like to drink? Ah, what's it to you? Oh, well, you know, my wife and I, we have this beautiful persimmon tree, and we like to sit under it and drink sake. I thought, you must have a lovely wife and a... Maybe you like to sit out in your lovely home and drink with her. And he starts to cry. Oh, my wife died. I lost my job. I'm terrible. I'm miserable. I'm a horrible person. And he sits down next to the old man as Terry Dobson stops. And he gets off. And he's very confused. And the drunk guy is laying with his head in the old man's lap. And he realizes that he had learned the forms of Aikido, but had not learned its essence. If he had beat the man up, he couldn't have helped him. It would have just continued that cycle of degeneration. Being seen and that elderly man going straight to that core, it began the seeds of regeneration. How am I doing for time, Jackie? 10 minutes, OK. Five minutes, OK, thank you. So um, there's a pre-Socratic Greek philosopher Herodotus who said, they do not see how pulling apart is pulling together as in the backbent tension of the bow and the lyre. If the limbs of your bow or the neck of your guitar cooperates with the body of your guitar, you'll never shoot the arrow and you'll never play a chord. Okay? That it's the tension that holds any fabric together. Okay, so the pattern for change in living systems is like acupuncture. It's a tiny little change. So think for a moment. I have all this bread dough. I have flour I've grind up. I've mixed it with water. And it's starting to spoil. Oh, I could try to kill whatever's trying to spoil it. Or I could spoil it into a lovely baguette. Right? Or into bread, into beer. Cheese, I have this milk that's going to go bad. Now we would ultra-pasteurize it and refrigerate it. Oh, I could make it into camembert. I live in a place where if I roll into the water, I'm going to get hypothermia. Oh, I'll make a boat that rolls right out. Right? Or my favorite is the igloo. I want to live, it's really cold here. I want to live, it's really cold here. I'll make shelter out of ice. Every creative thing that human beings have done is by valuing both sides of the activating and restraining forces. I'm going to give a couple of examples here. This is a project we did in Mexico, Playa Viva. It's an eco resort. The littlest change we did that made the biggest difference was instead of having a bypass exit off the highway that bypassed the little village, they had the entrance through this impoverished little village. So they connected both of them together. 
they began to work with the people to be able to grow food of very high quality biodynamically. It began to bring young people back to the village because there were viable jobs. Restarted this salt industry that had been there for eons, thousands of years, right? So you go to the eco resort, it's on the tables, people buy it, send them home, bring it home with them. But the best part was this. It's a place where turtles spawn. There were poachers. Their job was they'd go out and steal the eggs and sell them and it's how they fed their families. So at first we thought, oh, we'll hire guards and we'll arrest those guys, right? We said, no, we'll go talk to them. And we, everyone in the village knew who they were. So we said, hey, do you think you could maybe find the turtle nests? Uh, yeah. Do you think you could dig the eggs up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> do you think you could incubate them and then release them onto the beach with tourists. And they said, yeah. So they got a job as the stewards of the turtles. And I guarantee you, after they hatched their first litter of turtles, those were their turtles, right? So they were invested in the life cycle of those turtles more than anyone could be paid to be invested, right? This is the first release, not so many, right? So little change, big growth. Um, I want to tell one more project story. This is from a project we did not do. This is Prairie Crossing, and I want to use it because there's a, an academic paper written about it, about what keeps people from behaving ecologically even when they have ecological knowledge. Where is it? This is outside of Chicago in Illinois. Um, this professor got his grad students to go to prairie restoration sites and interview people about why the prairie and fire and bison were important. And it was like, it's our heritage, it's nature. Um, and then they randomly called people at Prairie Crossing, suburban homeowners. Every suburban homeowner could tell them why it was important to have deep-rooted prairie plants in their yards instead of shallow-rooted turf grass and the difference it made in the water quality and their ability to take their kids swimming in the pond, right? And they did it through 20% of your landscape has to be native plants. Some people did 100%. Then they saw the prairie restoration site that was part of the development being burnt by naturalists. And they said, hey, maybe we could burn our yards. So they organized to burn their yards. So a community that's able to organize to burn their yards together is a community that's able to evolve, to develop, and you're gonna have way better parties after burning all your yards together than after you go out and ride on your riding motor for an hour more every day, right? So in everything we're doing, we're looking for what are the existing patterns of how this place works? What are those patterns of the weaving of how the fabric is held together? And what are the least changes that would enable that weaving to become stronger, creative, and regenerative? All right, thank you. And if you're interested, this is our website. And um, I have a website you might be interested in called patternmind.com or patternmind.org. All right, thank you all. Thank, thank you, Jackie. You.